In this video, we'll be talking about Western blot. This is a detailed explanation on Western blot. Western blot is a frequently used technique in a molecular biology or biochemistry lab. So what does this technique detect? This technique can detect specific protein or your protein of interest in a mixture of protein or a patient sample. So here is a mixture of protein and our question is whether this particular pink protein or our protein of interest is present within that mixture or not. Western blot is a technique which can give us this answer. And the way Western blot works is the antigen antibody interaction. So here the protein of interest is detected by a primary antibody followed by a secondary antibody which is linked to some enzyme. So this is why Western blot is also termed as immunoblot because it utilizes the principle of antigen antibody interaction. Now let's talk about the Western blot workflow in details. So there are broadly three sets of uh, step. First step would be protein extraction from the cells or tissues or from patient serum etc. And the second step is separating the protein on a gel. And the third step is detecting the protein using antibodies in that western blot workflow. So these are the broad steps. So first step is the protein extraction which is done from uh, any kind of cells or tissues using lysis buffer. We'll talk about the lysis buffer composition in a moment. Second step is running the SDS paid gel or one dimensional gel to separate the proteins according to molecular weight. And the third part is transferring the proteins, all proteins from the membrane, from the gel to the membrane and later on using that membrane to detect whether our protein of interest is present or not. So these are the three broad st steps. And in each step, we would focus and understand the details. So the first step is basically SDS page. So in this case, before we even start the procedure, we have to think about the step zero, which means isolating the protein from the cells. In this case, proteins has to be isolated. So we need to have a protein extract or protein mixture. And that is done using a buffer known as RIPA lysis buffer. This is the composition of the RIPA lysis buffer which has several components. Alongside this buffer, a protease inhibitor cocktail is also provided just to prevent the degradation of the proteins. Then next step is to run these extracted protein mixture on a SDS page one dimensional gel. So here we load the gel in the particular SDS SDS gel and then we wait for some time we allow the gel to run and the proteins are separated on basis of their molecular weight so here since we use only one parameter that is the molecular weight of the protein to separate them from each other this is known as one dimensional gel electrophoresis as well so question is how this gel is made the gel is made out of acrylamide and nn methyl bisacrylamide so these these polymerize to form the polyacrylamide gel or page so in this case there is a gel holding cassette between these cassette there are two glasses where you pour the gel now the gel chemist the gel making chemistry is as follows it uses basically a free radical mechanism to polymerize tmade is one component that is used to accelerate or used as a catalyst in this process so if the free radical is represented as r dot then the reaction goes like this described here so just remember that in uh, western blot or in case of sds page gel making the chemistry behind this is a free radical polymerization chemistry now the question is how the uh, overall uh, like which percentage of the gel has to be made and it depends upon the need. For example, we want to separate a protein which is around 80 kilodalton or let's say 120 kilodalton. And in another scenario, we want to separate a protein which is like 13 kilodalton or 22 kilodalton. So obviously we can see there is a huge difference in the molecular weight. Now based on this molecular weight, different types of gel or different percentage of gel is used. For example, for bigger protein, if we need to separate, we used 10% gel. That means it has much bigger pore size. Whereas in order to resolve smaller proteins, we need to use a smaller pore size gel like 15% gel. A detailed catalog of all these percentage and which molecular ladder to be used can be available by the manufacturer company itself. 
Now let's see how proteins are actually separated in the gel. We need to talk about the chemistry and the biology behind that. So Western blot, oh, sorry, the SDS page gel has two components to it, stacking gel and the resolving gel. Stacking gel is a portion where proteins are concentrated prior to their run in the resolving gel. And resolving gel is the portion where the proteins are really separated on basis of their molecular weight. So differences in the composition of stacking gel and resolving gel is really important to understand. And this kind of system is capable to finely resolve protein according to their molecular weight. So let us talk about the percentage of the gel. So the stacking gel is broadly 5%. So it has very big pore size, whereas resolving gel could be variable. For example, in this case, 12%, it could be also 15 or 10% as well. Now the pore size is obviously larger in case of stacking gel. The resolving gel has relatively smaller pore size, but it also depends on the concentration. The ionic strengths are different. Also the pH are different. So why there is so much of differences? And let's try to understand that. So imagine we are first uh, putting some SDS and beta markup to ethanol with the extracted protein samples. So in this case, what happens is if the protein has positive and negative charges, when we coat them with SDS, it would have a uniformly negative charge around them. This would allow, this would ensure that when the proteins are separated on the gel, they are solely separated on the base of molecular weight not the charge so now every protein is coated by sds and negatively charged now if this is the overall gel and the proteins are loaded there and they the proteins are negatively charged so they would be moving from the negative electrode to positive electrode now there are also other components in the buffer such as the chloride ion the glycine and also the protein which are coated with uh, sds so a first chlorine ion would move quickly because it's negatively charged, smaller in size, it would quickly move towards a positive electrode. Then the protein would move after that. And lastly, the glycine ion would move. At pH 6.8, it is protonated. So it is positively charged. So it would be lagged behind. So sandwiched between the glycine ion and the chloride ion, these protein molecules move in a stringent manner. And they all stack up before the resolving gel. It's kind of kind of like a realigning the athletes near the starting line. So now it's time for them to move into the resolving gel. Now resolving gel has a different pH. Always remember because it has a pH 8.8. .8. At this point of time, the chloride ion would be moving very fast. Now the glycine ion also start moving fast because at that particular pH, it is not anymore protonated. It has negative charge so it is now anionic right that's why it moves very quickly now the protein would be moved afterwards based on their molecular weight so this is the overall function of stacking and the resolving gel now let's the final step two is to run the gel so the gel is run around 200 volts for about half an hour always somebody has to check for the gel while it is running and when the diffront actually leaves the uh, gel it is time to stop the gel after the gel is run properly, it is important now to stain the gel. This is how our unstained gel broadly look like. After staining with specific reagent like Kumasi Blue, it would look like this. If one can clearly understand there is a molecular weight ladder on the right hand side and there are specific bands which corresponds to different type of proteins present in this sample. Now the question is which stain to use? and what criteria determines which stain we should be using. So there are different stains which one can possibly use. There is Kumasi Brilliant Blue stain, there is Silver stain, there is Ponshu. Now Silver stain is very sensitive. For example, if you want to detect proteins as low as 5 to 10 nanogram, Silver stain is the choice. Ponshu also detects at a level of 200 nanogram or higher. Now there, there are other stains such as Zinc stain, Cypro Ruby stain, Nile red stain. Now each of these stains has their own purposes, own benefits and own uh, disadvantages. A, a quick overview is provided in this particular chart. Now let's move slowly to the western blot because we have separated the protein in the gel. Now it's time to blot and detect whether our protein of interest is present or not. When we separate the gel on a when we separate the protein on a gel, 
our protein of interest might be present might not be present in the mixture as well it's just a separation and segregation of the protein on a gel now let's talk about how we can transfer the proteins that we have separated in the gel into a membrane and this is done by electroblot so here a pvdf membrane is placed on top of the gel and then it is sandwiched between layer of paper towels and then it is moved into a gel holder cassette further this gel holder cassette is uh, embedded into a buffer tank which has a transfer buffer now this transfer happens under the influence of electrical field now we already know the proteins that are present in the SDS gel they have negatively negatively uh, charged because they are basically coated with SDS so they would possibly move towards the positive electrode right so they would move from cathode to the anode and that's what is done in this particular step so eventually all the content of the gel would be now transferred into the particular membrane or the PVDF membrane now then a blocking step is performed it is done to prevent non-specific binding of antibodies so blocking buffer coats all the uh, portions of the membrane that is such that the antibody does not non-specifically bind to the membrane it should find the protein of interest always so blocking solution is generally made up of non-fat milk or bovine serum albumin and this step ensures that antibodies later on does not stick to the membrane now then ultimately a uh, protein a uh, uh, primary antibody is added to detect whether our protein of interest is present or not if the protein of interest is present primary antibody should be detecting it like shown here and if it is not present it should not be getting detected so obviously after primary antibody adding the overall solution is kept overnight in 4 degree centigrade in a shaking condition so later on in the next day the washing step is done to remove and wash away all the non-specific bound antibodies or other interactions later on secondary antibodies are also added secondary antibody binds on the back of primary antibody so obviously if the protein was there primary antibody should be there and the secondary antibody should be detecting it and ultimately there would be another washing step a couple of washing steps which ensures the all the non-specific secondary antibodies bound here and there would be removed ultimately we have to develop the blot in order to develop the blot there are different strategies there are colorimetric strategies where the secondary antibody is bound with uh, enzyme which upon sub which upon giving substrate would be converted into a color product there are also chemiluminescence uh, detection where there is an en chemiluminescent uh, Pro uh, converting protein which would convert a substrate into a product which would be chemiluminescent and then there would be also fluorescence based de detection where the secondary antibody is fluorophore tagged so based on the fluorophore one can detect the fluorescence coming out from that sample so all these methods can be used each method has their own difficulties and sensitivities widely used methods are chemiluminescence and fluorescence fluorescence methods are pretty sensitive but also expensive so these gels are actually imaged in a gel scanner or blot scanner which has an imaging system to adjust exposure focus etc so this is how one can get a picture perfect western blot now that let's now let's talk about the applications of western blot in bit more details with some examples so here are some clinical applications and biomedical applications it's a very widely used bread and butter technique for biochemistry labs so let's say how western blot can be used to study cell signaling in a cell signaling pathway you always know that there are some proteins that phosphorylate other downstream proteins and this is how signaling pathways go on so sometimes phosphorylation is a readout of activation of a signaling pathway so in this case how one can use western blot to detect these kind of scenarios so one can really have antibodies again un unphosphorylated versus phosphorylated conformation of that protein and try to detect a ratio of these two from the patient from the particular sample so let's say there is a map kinase pathway we know that there are ras map kinase pathway involves raf make arc etc so phosphorylation of arc is one of the sign that map kinase pathway is activated and this can be actually visualized using western blot 
So obviously, if there is more and more phospho arc, then the signaling pathway is activated, right? So in this case, in the blot, you can see when the ligand is present, there are more phospho arc compared to the normal arc. So arc to phospho arc ratio is an indicative in this particular case of the signaling activation. Now, let's say another signaling pathway involves, let's say, nuclear receptors, which upon ligand binding move from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. So the question is how this can be detected on a western blot. So obviously one can simply um, look for ligand versus no ligand situations and extract the nuclear and cytoplasmic fractions using ultracentrifugation. From those extracts one can probe for the protein of interest in this case this particular nuclear receptor from, uh, from these extracts. And if somebody sees um, enhanced nuclear fraction or presence of that protein in nuclear fraction and a reduction in the cytoplasmic fraction that means what that means the protein has translocated into the nucleus in this case carefully notice the cytoplasmic fraction when the ligand was absent there are more proteins in the cytoplasm than the nucleus but when the ligand was uh, present the plus sign look the cytoplasmic fraction has reduced and the nuclear fraction has increased instead that simply means the protein has physically moved from the cytoplasm to the nucleus so these kind of research questions can be addressed using western blot these are very simple examples that i am providing you for your understanding so i hope this video was useful if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up don't forget to like share and subscribe you can support our channel using super thanks which is a heart shape icon present on the bottom right corner of the video by clicking on it, you can pay via PayPal, Paytm or UPI. See you in next video.